this it's something no one else talks about. You know this, right? That nobody else talks about what you talk about. Right? I believe that if it was already being covered, I wouldn't have you know wasted time. I feel like this this angle that I'm coming from is it's well, something that's not widely promoted. Yeah, it's not. And and I I I I want to get into this side. And then I I'll... want you to get into this side. <laughs> yeah. Come well, over to the I'm bright going, side. Uh, to to the <laughs> to the light. Come to the light. Um, <laughs> yes, don't do not stay on the dark side. You're living so, in music darkness right now. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else I talk to, the Jessies or whoever, they're going to talk about you know libraries and I like I know I I know a guy who literally makes multiple six figures, not just from his PRO, but also from his sync payments and stuff like that. So, and that's all libraries. He's just got 2000 songs in libraries. And so, uh, and some trailers, he does some trailers. And if too. you could just imagine, like you could take one song and walk into sync and get one Super Bowl commercial and get that same amount of money. And so this is the, we're going to talk about it. Hey folks, my name is Eric Copeland and thanks for joining us today. I think you're going to love this interview with Tamara Bubble. It is going to change the way you think about sync licensing or at least give you other things to think about. Remember that you can get free stuff. Just go to makemusicincome.com slash free and get our free courses and all that kind of stuff. Always have free stuff for you. The other thing I want to talk about is version three of Getting In Sync my ebook about how I got in sync and how you can get into sync. And this is going the whole way as my last ebook did. It's going to be moving into a full course with interviews from all the people, including Tamara Bubble in this interview, talking about how they got started in sync. So you're going to want to get this ebook now, and then that'll be a discount later for you to get the course. So get the new version of Getting In Sync version three, you can find the link down below. Now about today's video with Tamara Bubble, I did have some connection issues with her during this interview, but that doesn't matter because the audio is good and you're going to want to listen to this. You may see sometimes when her video goes out, but you're going to want to pay attention to every single word she says in this video because it is going to blow your mind on a different way to do sync licensing. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event. In this corner, this corner, the way most online gurus suggest you license your music for TV and film, the master of the passive placement, the sometimes your song is never going to be heard, but you do it anyway, because all you got to do is load it up and wait, music libraries. And in this corner, the way artists and songwriters get their music into TV and film, the hustle for the must sell. The I Hear Money. Get all your royalties and take out that middle man. Syncing music directly. Oh, all right. Well, let's get ready to rumble. All right. So, uh, silliness aside, I am here with the amazing Tamara Bubble. She is a just, uh, we, we, we've talked before. Do you realize it's almost been two years since we talked the first time? It was in November of I 2021. Did not. And time is flying. yes, and we really talked mostly about how you got into licensing, how you started as a, a starving artist and then and, 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 and a day job and then and transferred into licensing. And we both kind of started in the Kathy Heller program. Uh, that's how I started this whole deal and found out about all about licensing. I actually just heard her on a podcast and and, uh, and followed up with it. And next thing I know, I'm in this thing. So um and it changed the course of all of my producing. I, instead of producing artists, nice. I, I just said, I'm going to produce for, I mean, I'm going to compose and, and write what I want to write and stuff, but I'm like an artist would, but as, as a composer, probably more. And I do a lot of pop songs too. But I said, I'm going to steer all that towards licensing and, and then also Spotify and stuff instead of artist work, which it was not what I want to do anymore. We talked about hustle. We talked about all the process. We talked about your book, Sync to Superstar, Book of Secrets. And which, are you still selling that book? I am. It is available everywhere from okay, sync to superstar.com. Yep. All right. And uh, we talked about all that stuff. And at the time, I believe this was 
when we talked about it, it was that right after the Save a Lot commercial, I believe. <laughs> like a lot, a lot. Like a lot, a lot. That means a lot, a lot. Like dance on back to the parking lot, a lot. So we talked about that. I think they're still running that commercial. Are they really? That's awesome. That was two years ago. Um, yeah, they renewed it. Well, that's because yeah. it was awesome. It was a great commercial. And... <laughs> So you're an artist, and do you still think of yourself as an artist these days? What has changed since then? We'll talk about the podcast later on, but as far as you uh, going from where you were when Save a Lot came came along, yep. and, and being an artist then, at, and starting to have real real success in sync, has anything changed since then? What have you been doing since then? I am more artist now than I ever will be. <laughs> I actually get to fully explore the creativeness the genre hopping, like the, the beauty of sync is that you can make money from any and every genre, even if you're creating all the music. Like mm -hmm. when you're on a label, you're limited to a genre. You're limited to what they're willing to pay to promote. You sometimes don't even get to write your own songs. Yeah. I have explored my uh, creativity to the fullest. And then even the financial freedoms, like I'm, I'm not spending my money on promoting my music. It's getting promoted through the music licensing. So I have been nothing but artistry and I'm going to, and fully willing to tour once a song takes off and an audience is willing to pay me to see me perform it live. And so I can be com full and complete artist. Um, so I love it. I love it here. <laughs> cool. Well, and, and you, you are a great artist and that's, that's probably, that's Thank a big you. secret of your success. And you've, um, you've always attacked it that way. And I think, um, to be honest, what we're going to talk about today, which is going directly to the source and dealing directly yourself with the source from your artist perspective. And I, I tell everyone, I think that music supervisors are the new A&R. I think they are the people who are looking for that artist that they can find, that that diamond that nobody else has. And if they can find that artist, it's like a win for them to find that that superstar or, or just an artist that has really syncable stuff and if they find that it's like wow how did and people are like how did you find that who is that you know and so, they get they get bragging rights for it they get yeah. it actually can change the trajectory of their career and the shows that they're music supervising yeah. so you have to keep that in mind like music buyers is what i call them but they are looking for the top-notch artists the amazing songs the stuff that's not already out here because it can change their careers mm -hmm. um when they have a story to tell from a placement that they did Oh, we got the streams up on this TV show for da 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 da. These like this is the all time watch, most watched season because of the music that we placed in it. So it helps them um, to find yeah. artists that are amazing. That's cool. Also, you have been getting into some into the space here with us on on YouTube and in podcasts and stuff like that. And and uh, I I love your explanation for why you're doing that. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I have a, a podcast um, called I Hear Money, and I'm literally just teaching artists, producers, songwriters that um, how to reach superstardom, how to get where I am now. Like, I don't want anybody to look around and feel like, oh, she's up there and it's so far away and I don't know how to get to it. I'm literally just teaching as I live. Like, I'm, I'm not like coaching because I'm out of the game. I'm currently doing the things that I'm teaching. You have to be doing the thing that you're talking about. And so I can't run a, 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 a channel about making music income if I don't make any music income. And luckily, exactly. every single income that I make is music based. There's no other income, even though, you know, some people would say teaching is not. But hey, I'm sitting there teaching about Pro Tools and Logic and beat making and, and all that kind of stuff all day. That's music work. And and I provide the same service to the students. You know, they're all 18 yep. to 25 30 and they need to know about the music business and about licensing you know i'm sometimes the first pe person who tells all those students about licensing they've never even thought about their music being on tv or if they did they didn't have any idea how that happened so um you got to share this info okay well that's going to lead us right into the first round round one why direct sync? we're going to do three rounds round one is going to be why direct sync is better Round two I'm, is me going to be telling you why I think music libraries are better, or at least that why they are for me. And then round Ooh. three will round three will spar a little bit. We'll do a little rope a dope. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Feel free to expound on these in any way you want to. Round one: Why direct sync is better? Why do you prefer not to go the music library route? 
the main reason that I'll give is that um, di libraries require the same level of high quality music. I think when libraries were first in existence, they would take your trash. It was like a cesspool of just like the throwaway music that you didn't plan on putting out, you didn't plan on doing anything else with. That was what libraries were. Today, roll forward to 2023, libraries require the same high level quality that a major label re would, would require, that a major indie publisher require. They want top notch music and then they have a limitation to what they can sell. Remember libraries are based, the license fees are based on rate cards. These are predetermined rates depending on the usage and all of that stuff. And the library is just gonna take in a ton of amazing music and undervalue it. They're gonna undercut it. They're gonna sell it at a maximum of $1,000. And in the sync world, in the indie sync market, um, the minimum that you're getting or that you should be getting for a placement, the upfront minimum fee is $1,000. Why would I give it to a place that the maximum they can command is $1,000 when I can just walk right over here and give it to someone else and let them pitch it and they can command a minimum of $1,000. It's just like, this is not even a no, this is a no brainer. This is like, so I want $1,000 max or $1,000 minimum. Hmm, I'll go with the minimum. And that's where, that's that's what I'll start with. <laughs> Have you ever been in any libraries at all, ever? Um, when I started to see the other artists that would tell me, Oh, I got sync placements. I have my music in a library. Or I would see artists post online. Oh, I found out about this placement nine months later. And I like, so they couldn't promote it. They couldn't, I don't know that I ever actually have been in one. And I will say that because I learned to stay away because of the horror that was being presented to me. Like people would tell me, oh, my music's been in this show and in this show, but I couldn't promote it. I didn't know about it until I saw it on my PRO statement and it was like, what? Like, yeah. that's how you find out about it? Started thinking like, well, if you find out about it months later and the only way you find out about it is from the back end, there's no upfront, then how do you know if they're like typed something wrong or sent the wrong cue information over and you never got the payment? And I couldn't live with that. I feel like anytime you have a career, if your control is limited, if you don't know about what's going on with your money, somebody can easily take it. The accountant in me doesn't settle for that. <laughs> like a lot of people, when they just give all their money to an accountant, the accountant usually can take it because it's like you're not managing and watching your own stuff. Even when you hire somebody to do something, you should still have enough knowledge about it to know what's going on and to make sure there's no way you can be getting ripped off. And let's remind everybody, you were a CPA before you started this. Is that correct? Absolutely. Formerly licensed CPA. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this person comes from a place where she is going to know where every penny is going and know where every penny that she is making is. And she wants to know where it is. And, and uh, you're not willing to put it in. I mean, even because these are just publishing deals. I, I, tr I dreamed my whole uh, like teen life and 20s life that all I wanted was a music publishing deal. If I could just get a music publishing deal, which is basically what these libraries are offering, a 50-50 split. I get the writers, they get the publisher, and then we split the sync. And that's that's basically what I would sign with just about any music publisher company, music publishing company, right? If, if I'd signed a deal with a publisher, they would get the publishing side, I would get the writer side. And then if they got me a sync, that we would probably split that sync as well. That's just a kind of a boilerplate like music business music publishing deal would you agree no, to an extent i think libraries are bootleg publishers and here why here's why if you have those same songs with a sync agent you will and say the agent takes 50 percent of the, the uh, sync placement fee you still get a hundred percent of the publishing and you get this new additional fee that libraries are not giving the upfront that's where mm -hmm. the money is in sync licensing mm -hmm. not in the royalties and by that i mean if you have to make five million songs in order to see a profit no human is going to be able to maintain that amount of output. And by the time you do it, you're going to be burnt out. It's not going to be the love that you initially had for music. It's like now you're working for music. You yeah. want your music to work for you. And so, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, I'll say this too. Sorry. Can I say one ahead. other thing about I, publishing? You can say anything you the, want the to true, say. <laughs> the true benefit of publishing and why they would take half of your publishing in order to exploit your records is because they're supposed to be able to get you indoors that you couldn't otherwise get. These libraries placements are like the bottom of the barrel and not and no, and no offense if you have library placements, but if you're just giving me little cues, 20 second, 30 cues on a reality TV show that hardly no one is watching or 
that that's not like the cream of the crop where they deserve 50 percent of your money they should be taking a smaller percentage because they're just sitting it in a room letting someone else come in and do the work and license it they're not actively pitching it your sync agent is going to be actively pitching and publishers the reason why they take 50 percent is because they're going to get you in the room with beyonce's teams things that you couldn't otherwise get to like they should have if you're giving up 50 percent of your publishing it should be to get me to connections i couldn't otherwise reach yeah let's talk about your average deal when um and look uh, I mean, I know you you rep different artists now, right? You have different people yeah. that are part of your agency. And um, would you call yourself a Seek agent? You are a Seek oh, agent? Yeah. Okay. yeah, for goodness sake, uh, it's an exclusive catalog. I rep about 500 indie artists now. All right, so let's talk about a regular deal for you. And uh, you or one of your artists releases a tune and you send this out, I would imagine, to the the people that you know in the business, the, the what you call them, the buyers? Mm -hmm. The music buyers. Yeah, <laughs> the music buyers. You send them music out to supervisors, the music supervisors, yep. You send it out to the music buyers and the music buyer comes back and, and they, and, and this is what most people need to understand about this, the, the way this is. And this is the way that I, I always sit there and go, how can I do, I need to be doing this because um, they come back to you and you do the deal directly with them, the sync part. And then, and, and what do, let, what does the average music supervisor ask for monetarily? So, um, so there's no average price that they ask for. You have to look at the terms. No, I'm um, saying what do they are, ask for? What do they want from it monetarily? Probably nothing, right? A music supervisor. Oh, the, no, no, no. They get paid separately from the production. But asking for money or a piece of your licensing, it's something like really shady, janky. I wouldn't even get involved in it. Um, they get paid separately from the production. They have an entirely separate budget for their work. Um, right. So they're coming to you trying to get you the most money that they can give, but at the same time, they have other cues in the show, and they're also trying to please other people. They're also trying to get major label artists. Um, so they're just trying to stretch the budget as far as they can to get all the songs that they want. Right, yeah. And I think that's important for people to realize is that music supervisors aren't part of the pie, aren't part of the take. Right. They are only doing a deal because they're getting paid to do this job and that's their take. They're getting the yep. money for you and getting the uh, taking the budget that they have and giving these, whatever the upfront payment, it's coming directly to, uh, for goodness sake. And, and then uh, whoever the writer is, uh, is getting all the writing and whoever the publisher is, is getting all the publisher. And none of that is anybody but you and your clients, correct? Correct. We don't even touch your publishing. We submit your cue sheet information the same way a library would. The thing that we're negotiating is the upfront sync licensing fee. And that's something that most people in libraries don't ever see. This is a whole new pot of money. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's such a totally different way than, than everyone else talks about this, which is put this in a music library. Uh, to you, and I've listened to your podcast, and I know from talking to you last time and from this conversation, it just doesn't make one lick of sense for you to put something and wait for money that you're not sure will ever come. And the fact that people are coming, to, you are just putting your, your, your songs out. And I, I think most people will, will be just like, why aren't I doing this? Why, why would I be putting stuff into a library waiting for a $35 payment for 1 million streams from a Hulu show? And which I had like last month, it was a Hulu, um, uh, you know, Christmas movie or something, that lifetime-y type of thing. And I had one song on there and it had over a million and a half streams on Hulu just for this one pay period. And I made like 30, 40 bucks, you know. Now, granted, they don't play great on the back end, even for you probably, right? Who, the, the streamers don't pay great in their back end. Well, they have, it's pre-negotiated rates. And of course, they're probably fractions of a penny per stream, similar right. to, um, you know, DSPs and just releasing your music commercially. Streaming is not where the money is unless you're in the tens of millions of streams. But the beauty of music licensing is that you get that free promotion to get your songs that opportunity. Yeah. Usually with licensed cues, it's like maybe just instrumental, little, it's like a music bed. It's usually background low, if you can barely hear it, cut up and chopped up into the dialogue. And yeah, so what, the library mind. placements are not featured. They're not montages, they're not theme shows. They're not, they're not things that are, can actually move the needle in your streams to the public. Okay. So your way of, of putting this out to the music buyers and dealing directly with them works. Uh, let's go to round two. Bong. Round two. Why music libraries 
for me at least, I think are better. And um, I'll say this, I prefer music libraries because I'm not sure I have the time to do the hustle that you do. I'm not sure I have the time for all of the phone calls, for all of the networking that it's going to take for me to find these music buyers. I'm not finding it's there's somebody else at least doing a little bit of hustle for me. I know them personally because I've been talking with them for years as far as these library owners. Um, I get continual uses from the same library, although so do you. Um, uh, many music supervisors can find my songs over and over again because they're, you know, my main two are in BMG uh, and Universal Library. So those are rather large things for them to search through and find what they need. And finding the right song for the right sound, the, sorry, finding the right person for the right song to me seems like a shot in the dark, but you're not approaching it that way. You're not approaching one person with one song, right? Absolutely. But also they're approaching me. And so uh, I have a, a course that I teach. It's my advanced music licensing course. But basically I'm showing you how to reach any music buyer that you want. So if you know what TV show, oh, my music needs to be on this show. I'll show you how to reach that person and I'll show you how to reach out to them in a way that they will respond and not block and delete you. And so those are the things that are gonna be key. I'm gonna teach you the proper relationship building. I'm gonna teach you how to get to shows you've never heard of that your music fits. There's a, a hustle to it, but there's a reason for it. And then I also teach, if this is too much work for you, you can get with agents where they'll do the work that I do for you. Now, of course you have to give up commission. Um, so I teach two, two methods um, in the course, straight direct to the music buyer, go through an agent. So you pick your poison and you can do both. I show you how to do both in the class as well. So it's like, if you feel like, oh, I don't want to network. I don't want to build relationships. I don't want to meet these people and make a hundred percent of my money. I don't know who would say that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if really. that's something you're saying, <laughs> there's another way where you can still get access to these high profile, these premium licensing opportunities instead of just saying, oh, let me just throw it in a library. Because remember, if it's easy, then the reward is probably not great. More risk, yeah. more reward, right? So if you can throw three albums worth of material, 500 songs worth of material in this one land of library music, every other artist is doing the easy thing too. There's 20, 50 million songs in there. Mm -hmm. So just as easy as they could find you, it's just that easy for them to lose you. It's like playing the mega mega millions. Yeah, you can win one in 292 million. That's like finding your song in a library. Yeah. If the metadata is correct, what if they got your songs and they didn't do the metadata on it and the metadata got lost or whatever? You yeah. will never get a placement on that song. It will sit in library purgatory. So. Yeah. so to you, the answer is as simple in your brain. The answer to to licensing is as simple as networking and building a list of music buyers. Uh, I don't think it's that simple, but <laughs> it's that simple. is one of the key things. <laughs> I won't say it's simple. Yeah. So the reason, but the reason why it's worth it is because of the payoff. Yeah. If I get one placement this year that I've licensed direct to a music supervisor for six figures, and I do that, <laughs> the next year they renew it again, I didn't even have to repitch to anybody for the next year. I've made my income this year, and then next year when they renew, I've made my income again. And so that's what I teach at a, as a starting point, a minimum of six figures per year annually and consistently. Um, so I've been doing this, what I call sync superstardom, for the past five years since I got into sync. But what I'm saying is you don't have to work as hard. Yes, you have to work hard initially in the beginning to build up your catalog, but you were making these millions of songs anyway for libraries. Yep. Now you've just found another place that's willing to pay you more money for it. So that you don't even have to create or crank out as much quantity of music. If you just focus on the quality and make high quality stuff and get it to these buyers, you will see one or two placements come in, your work is done for the year. You don't need to see a cue sheet with 2000 placements and wonder if, oh, did they miss a few? Like there's a chance that with all these cues, somebody didn't get paid. I know that you teach this and you probably don't want to get too deep into this, but where does someone start if they're saying, I want to be the next Tamara Bubble. I want to. I'm not going to start an agency necessarily, but I do want to build a, a an email list, a, a Mailchimp or whatever list that they're going to build, and they're going to build this business themselves of their music. Could I just start 
doing research, going to uh, things where they're they're doing interviews online with yeah, Mark. I can't remember. Him. Yeah, Mark, and going to Mark's things and paying that seventy five bucks or whatever, or what up pitches those those ladies who do that kind of same thing. Are you familiar with them? Which is the best name, other than for goodness <laughs> sake, other than for other goodness than, sake, right. they do the same thing that, that Mark does. You know, they do the. The mm -hmm. listening sessions, the listening with sessions, a, yeah. With a, and you pay to be part of that. And I've heard you talk about this before. And in your book, you talk about it. It's worth the seventy-five bucks to make that relationship. Yep. Not in the in the book, from sync to superstar. But basically, listening sessions are a way for you to jumpstart. You have to remember how many artists are doing music. If that puts you in a room with ten or fifteen other people, like it's not hard for them to remember a name when there's only ten names I have to remember. <laughs> Yeah. And they, you get this introduction in a way that other people don't get. Usually when you meet somebody, it's like, oh, hi, hi, nice to meet you. I do this, da, 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 da. They go home and they forget if you see them at a conference or whatever. If you meet them at a listening session, they're going to see you, hear you, hear your artistry, hear your music. Like they're going to put all of this. And if it's amazing, that is one of the connections that you can't put a price on because they're going to remember this for, they can come back five years later and license your song. And they remember the song. They kept the song. They downloaded the song. Um, from the listening session, and they reach out two years later with a $30,000 $30, commercial. And you, you made a $75 investment. You just were there in the room of seven, right. And uh, that sounds like great ROI from, to me. <laughs> yeah. What about blind emailing music supervisors? A no-no or a yes-yes, depending on if you have the right tunes as far as trying to open up that door and say, uh, this is what I do. I've been watching your shows. I've been I've researched you, and I think you use similar music to the kind of, that I do. I'm not going to say any more. No, no long emails. Just a couple of paragraphs. Is it as easy as that? Can you blind email these music buyers? Um, so I I have there's two types of emails you can send out. Cold emails I think are a no no. Um, cold okay. emails are, um, you, my music is perfect for this. My music. Listen to, to my music. Check out my music. It just sounds like begging. Yeah. Um, I teach and I talk about this in the book actually too, but in my course, I definitely show you how to do this. But in the book, I talk about hot emails and these are helpful emails. These are emails that the music buyers need. So it's almost as essential as like them dropping $10 and you tap them on the shoulder and say, Hey, here's your $10 that they were looking around for and couldn't find. You're being helpful to them. They're going to open the email yeah. and they should be able to tell that from the subject line. It shouldn't gotcha. sound like you're begging for a placement. It should sound like you're making your their job easier for them. Yeah. So when you send an email out to all your buyers, it probably says up tempo rap, positive song. I mean, some kind of descriptive thing that, that makes them go, Oh yeah, I, I need that actually this week. Would you say that happens? It, it ever? says something that they need. It says something that they need right now. And the reason why I know this is because they open the email, they download the emails, and I've gotten licenses from it. I've yeah. started to get briefs from it. And so these are people that I haven't met yet. These are people that I do not know. Mm -hmm. And so that is the importance of it. Um, I'm not sending them something that looks like they need to do me a favor. I'm right. sending them an email that where I'm doing them a favor and they remember that and in turn they come back and use the music, they come back and send me briefs and I'll say that because I think you asked about this earlier. So there's not always in music licensing pitches. Um, there's catches. They start sending me the placements without me having gotcha. to do the work. That yeah. is free money and it yeah. is top tier free money because when they send you something to catch, there's no usually other like competition. It's usually they're crunched for time. They know that you're solid. They know your uh, their music is one stop. They know that it's clearable, easy clearable. Mm -hmm. So they know you own the rights. They know there's no lawsuits coming. They know or assume that you've taken care of any samples. They know there's no unclear samples and they're coming to you, giving you money. <laughs> yeah. That is the music licensing dream. Like yeah. I didn't have to work for that. I didn't wake up and try to find out what they were working on. They sent me money. All right. So here's the big question I want to ask you since I, again, I have composers here not artists yeah. who sing. Could this same thing work for composers that works for artists? The reason that I know there's no difference between songwriters, artists, or composers is because when you look at the PRO statement, you're all listed as the writer. And mm -hmm. if you own your publishing, you all have a piece of the publishing. Um, and actually in my podcast, I think episode three, I, that is the title of it. Dear composers and writers, you are an artist. Because mm -hmm. I think they're not aware of it. I think they think because they have one side of the song or one component of the song, they're not an actual artist. Most of the DJs overseas are the artists. Mm -hmm. They get major artists to be the featured artists. 
they all have stage names. They mm -hmm. all have brand names. And when I release the song, even commercially, once we get a placement, I put on there who it's produced by. They are an artist too. So I don't, they're not listed. Like I'm still listed as the artist on Spotify, but on the cover art, I have who produced the song. I don't want people to guess about that. I want them to get promotion out of the work that they've done. And I think a lot of producers feel like that's always been something that where they're in the background. Production is not in the background. As a matter of fact, for music licensing, a lot of times they're gonna strip the vocal. But there is this symbiotic relationship in sync where in order to sell the song and be able to make money, the big money in music licensing for indie artists, you need a full vocal version. So you do need to collaborate with an artist, but a lot of times they're gonna pull the vocal and only be able to use the instrumental or yeah. maybe bits and pieces of the song. Sure. So you yeah. need the full song to sell the full song, but they're probably gonna use the instrumental. So that is how important the production is. Instead of sending all this great music to libraries, get us somebody to top line on it and you guys split it and keep all your publishing and sharing that. Yeah. You're used to giving up 50% anyway, but it's yeah. so crazy because if an artist reaches out to a producer nine times out of 10, they say, oh, I don't do production work for free. I'm not doing this. Like, they don't like to collaborate with artists generally. It's like, pay me. Uh, but where? you're giving half of your entire song's payment to a publisher yeah. that is just not doing any work. It's sitting in a library and getting cheesy fees. When if you were to just collaborate for free with this artist, I'm not saying you have to. If you have to charge, you just charge. That's what you do. But what I'm saying is you could work with artists for free and get your payment at the end, like once it starts getting placed. Um, and I've converted a lot of producers because I'll collab with them and show them like, we're going to split this 50, 50. I'm not paying you up front, but I'm, you're going to get paid when this thing gets licensed more than I would have paid you up front. Um, and so I just want producers to realize that they are artists in the beat world, which is a, a strictly not strictly, but mostly hip hop, urban EDM, maybe, but mostly R and B hip-hop beat makers think of themselves as entities they think of themselves not just as composers but as artists you know and they or producers like you said producers mm -hmm. are probably a better word mm -hmm. they think of themselves as producers but almost every other genre people who are in classical or, or doing trailers or doing mm -hmm. uh jazz like i do or or any kind of the other weird stuff that i might do outside the realm of or or, or maybe just pop like uh regular pop we tend to think of ourselves, uh, if we're not doing vocals, as not as artists, but as composers. And we've got to think of ourselves as artists more. And then we've got to uh, approach these these music buyers. So one of the questions I had was, Is are music buyers music supervisors only? Who else are we talking about who is a music buyer? Um, so the people that work at ad agencies, like the creative mm -hmm. directors, the broadcast producers, those guys are music buyers. Any, honestly, any business owner could be a potential music buyer. And I'll say this because I've had indie businesses that just like my song. They just found it somewhere, maybe from a TV show. And that's another thing about music licensing. <laughs> when you get these featured placements, people can come from all over the place and then hire you to do work. Like mm -hmm. the calling card is the placement. Yeah. Um, but if it's buried in, a, in some kind of queue where it's just the instrumental and nobody can hear it, or, then it, it's they're li less likely to call you. If they hear the full vocal song, if you think about it, that's how Lizzo blew up, right? It's, it was the two characters in the movie were singing her song, word yeah. for word, that took a two-year-old song to number one on the billboard. The, just the access, um, the publicity, the free promotion, the free marketing of it, there's just so many benefits to it. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. I think you did. Yeah, uh, ad agencies, music supervisors. Oh, a business owner in general um can see your song like i had uh, someone else that had a podcast and they just hired me to use a song that i've already had licensed somewhere for the theme song of their podcast and mm -hmm. i've had other business owners that they may not have the money of like a major ad agency or a huge company but these small businesses need commercials and put commercials on tv they can license your music and still pay you four and five figures for these uh songs uses well at this point this is where i call the fight because uh, <laughs> I, I, I know that you are right. I don't, I, I have no doubt that you are correct. Okay. Uh, I, we just gotta, just, just, it's getting bloody. It's getting nasty. It's, I think anybody, <laughs> anybody listening to this is gonna know that you are right. And uh, the problem is, will people um, take the easy way or will they take the hustle way? And that's really where this comes down to. I, I teach all my students. I said, you can make money in music if you go out and work. If you don't go out and work, you're not going to make any money in music. And, and I, I'll say this too, like 
if you think about it, if you want the easy way, I'm not saying you have to knock down the door of every music buyer and, and try to figure out how to network with them. You could use an agent. So if we just compare agents to libraries, the music's gonna sit in the library, an agent is gonna actively pitch. An agent is gonna get you a placement that's way more lucrative than the placement in the music library. And you'll get to keep 100% of your publishing. How do people approach yeah. you? You know, how do they get to you? Um, and so I have a private Facebook group. Uh, it's called For Goodness Sake. Um, I accept submissions twice a year. So if you're in the Facebook group, you can pitch to me. Um, that's the only way I accept it because of legal reasons. I can't take unsolicited music. Um, so I just open submissions up twice a year through that portal. But I also in there am teaching and showing you how to get the music prepared to be able to pitch to me what I need from you. I need it to be one stop. I need it to be no unclear samples, all that stuff. So I'll point that's you in the right it. direction. <laughs> yeah. What about uh, if if someone finds a sync a another sync agent? How would they would they approach them the same way they approach a music supervisor with or a music library and say yeah, either the same I've way got, you approach a music library? I'm a composer. A few short sentences with a disco link and and the music. I would say I'm an artist. I have these songs. Uh, I do a lot of collaborations with other artists. You can let them know that you produce. Like <laughs> producing is your strong suit, but that you have um fully full vocal versions of songs and um just collaborate with artists collaborate with songwriters and top liners and get these full vocal versions use whatever you can at your disposal to get top line full songs um and then take those to the sync agents the same way you would go to a library and so just for clarification when you say full top line with song you mean with vocals and everything because that's that's probably how you're going to get the attention of a sync agent or uh, rather than uh, just sending them a bunch of a lot of score stuff and a lot of stuff like that, probably sync agents are so, not a, as interested in that. I, I think there's three tiers in music that people have to understand. There's the major label artist, right? And then there's the indie um, music, which the major labels are usually six figures and up, six, seven figures easy. Indie music is they use indies when they can't afford the majors, yeah, right? right? So those, that's usually from $1,000 to six figures and up. And then underneath that is the libraries. It's less than $1,000 or usually no upfront fee and just royalty only. Um, the thing that you want to do is present yourself as an artist, collaborate with another singer and put your producer name featuring this artist. Just look at what those um, EDM DJs do overseas. Mm -hmm. The producer is the artist because of their beat and they just get a vocal feature. Right. So make full vo vocal versions of songs and sit back or go back and go make some more music the same way you were doing with libraries. But this time, if you have 2000 songs with a sync agent, you're probably making 100 X, 1000 X more than what you're making. If you have 2000 songs in a library, oh, and you have way more control. They'll notify you of what's going on. It, it's amazing. Well, it, it doesn't take 2000. I don't think at that point, I think that's it's a much lower. I mean, it's it's hundreds at that point, or it's just continued new music that you're putting out. And in, I remember from your last interview, you said you don't put anything out to, to Spotify or to the DSPs until it's been gone through the process of going to the music buyers. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I don't commercially release um, songs that haven't been placed. I talked about this in my book and just give the kind of full strategy yep. in there. But yep. but yeah, I I have a full strategy that I do for every single song. I know when I'm going to release it. It's going to be based on music licensing, when the placement is, because I want it to be a new, be like, oh, what's this amazing song? And then go Shazam it and find it and start streaming sure, it. And that's course. music promotion I didn't have to do. And when you do that and it's a new song, it looks like, Oh, you have this ama amazing, impeccable timing and your song just took off. But no, it was just a properly timed release with a marketing strategy. And music licensing is your marketing strategy. It is your marketing department. I don't pay for streams and things. And I have uh, a few million streams now from no promotion. Like I'm yeah. not saying check out my single. I'm just releasing the song when it gets the placement. Yeah. And the placement is bringing the audience basically. So that's amazing. Yeah. Here's a question I have for you. So you have a, let's say you have an email list of music buyers. Do you, and you have just a bunch of material. Let's say you've been building up high quality tracks for a long time, high quality songs. And mm -hmm. do you approach them weekly with a subject line that says, um, a, a female uh, up-tempo country song or uh, metal uh, whatever song or, uh, you know, Christmas, um, Christmas uh, pop 
vocal. Do you do you do that? Or, or how descriptive are you? And how often do you approach your music buyers with uh, new songs? As often as they come along. Um. So it, it's a little bit different for me for my agency, but I do that. I used to do it for me personally, but then I do it kind of the same way. But now I have other artists that I'm repping um, included in the new releases or new additions to the catalog. Um, I do email them regularly, but I, I kind of teach this in the course, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'll just say that I do keep a regular schedule with reaching out to them, to all of the, the buyers at once, but I don't even have to do that as much because yeah. that's more so for the, the music buyers that aren't interacting with me. Yes, I get briefs, so there's no need for me to send out, oh, here's what I'm working on because they're asking me, they're showing me what they're working on in the form of a music brief. And they're giving me a description of what they're currently working on and the music that they need right now. So there's no yeah. point in me really sending like, yeah, oh, here's the new thing work. that I'm working on because they, if they, if I have what they need right now, I'm going to get paid now. So yeah. <laughs> I, you don't even have to confuse it once you're getting, once you've built a relationship to where they're sending you their briefs, the door is kicked wide open. You don't need to send them, oh, this is my new music that I'm working on, but you can. And I do teach how to do both, but mm -hmm. the goal is to build a, a relationship of just delivering high quality music to the point to where they start to send you their request and what they're looking for right now. And now you can get the timing right because you know what they need when they need it. Mm -hmm. um, and so th that takes all the guests out of the way. Well, um, I think I have asked pretty much every question that I wanted to ask. And, and, and like I said, the fight is called. You have, you have come out victorious. Uh, but I, I, I believe in this <laughs> strategy. I mean, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't believe in going directly to the money? That's what your whole podcast is about. Your podcast is called I Hear Money. Awesome stuff. Tamara, thank you again for coming on and thank sharing this me. wisdom. And uh, I'll, I'll take my lumps and go back into yeah. my corner and you remain the champion, <laughs> super sync superstar. I will have all the links, of course, down here. No rematch. <laughs> uh, how can I? I am, I am outmatched. I am uh, uh, just in awe of your success. And, and I'm not really in awe. I mean, anybody who reads your book, and you should go read Tamara's book because it is, it is a uh, a rags to riches story. It's a riches to riches story, kind of. I mean, it's not that you weren't making any money as a CPA and successful. You were already successful in that world, but you knew that there was another way you want to go. And a lot of people come to me and say, "Hey, I, I'm a I'm a surgeon. I don't need money. I just want to have some success with my music yep. and things like that." So, yep. um, uh, but your story of going out onto the streets, literally and uh selling cds one by one to people to passers-by yeah. is just amazing and singing. i was singing by selling that was my calling card <laughs> that's crazy and so anybody everybody needs to read that book because it'll just inspire you even without the music tips it'll just inspire you in general about and and teach you the hustle we all have to learn to hustle at some point if you don't learn to hustle ever you're, uh, and I don't care what you're doing, you're not gonna have success. That's the hardest thing. Yeah, I, I always say um, the superstar is already within you. I'm just here to help you activate it. So activate. that's my goal. Superstar, activate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right, well, thank you so much for your time today. You're amazing, you do great work. And thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Take care.